Um, so I'm really excited to be chairing this panel. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce um, the first presenter who will be William Chavez. Um, William Chavez is a PhD candidate with the Department of Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. William, um, a scholar of American religion, folklore and popular culture is currently writing his dissertation on contemporary exorcists in the United States, specifically their strategies of modernization. Following the completion of his dissertation, he plans to study professional and amateur gaming tournaments, gaming expos, cosplay conventions, and similar gaming fandom congregations. Take it away, William. Okay. Thanks for having me. Um, the Friday 13th franchise is principally defined as a dysfunctional family drama that spills into a body count oriented slasher narrative featuring elaborate and graphic killings of altruists, sexually expressive subjects perpetrated mostly by a white male, queer, slow moving mass wearing mute group named Jason Voorhees. This paper examines three recent challenges to the story structures, monster constructions and meta narratives that accompany a famous slasher. Within Friday 13th, the game from 2017, an online survival horror game this traditional 90 minute slasher is adapted into asymmetric gameplay, eight counselors versus one superpowered Jason, with the stock kill escape contest condensed into 20 minutes. But then Vicente de Sani's uh, Never Hike Alone, also from 2017, a 54 minute fan film where Jason stalks a single unsuspecting male through hiking vlogger, the traditional movie killing spree involving roughly a dozen sexually active youths is completely removed. Within Jenny Lee's Webzine and Camp Counselor Jason from 2020, please follow her on Twitter and Patreon, the traditional character appearance and function of Jason is reimagined in the form of a demisexual and queer himbo, the new protector deity of Camp Crystal Lake. This franchise draws from a complex fluidity of family resemblances governing content, structure, style, and meta narrative. With Jason, old or young, dead or alive, often serving as the most sufficient of conditions. By content, yes, I refer to specific items or locations popular within the series. The hockey mask, Crystal Lake, cabins, getaway lodges, machete, uh, machetes, but also stock characters, jokesters, jocks, druggies, and more. For those that have never seen a Friday the 13th film, official or fan-made, let me give you a comprehensive overview. Although Jason Goes to Hell features a much older cast of town locals, the films mostly involve a young cast of traveling outsiders, a small circle of friends or romantic couples wandering around the woods, with the exception of Jason Takes a Cruise or Jason Takes Manhattan, and Freddy vs. Jason, one of the few times Jason enters the suburbs. Thus, these babes in the woods are stalked and killed by a mass killer, his mother, or someone whose body he's possessed. So how do we then characterize most of the events of these films? Well, it's a lot of oblivion, characters that don't fully understand the grave situations they face. They socialize, go on romantic walks, prank each other, go hiking and swimming. And yes, there's nudity, explicit sex and other sexual content all of which are violently interrupted through a series of ambushes, a few chases, and grabs, especially once a person or two is alone. There's also a fair amount of disconnected action, the killing of those unrelated to the main cast so as to increase the total body count. The remaining characters then justify to themselves why some members of the group have disappeared until a small inner circle of survivors realizes the severity of the situation and attempts to survive through fight or flight. At the third act of the film, there's what YouTuber Dead Meat affectionately dubs the final girl circuit, so named after a long chase scene that usually loops back on it to itself. Interposed with a horror version of hide and seek, door smashes, a destruction of windows, walls, and more. Along with the killer finally taking on heavy damage. At this time, the bodies, or sometimes parts of bodies, are discovered by or forcibly revealed to the final protagonist, further escalating the sense of dread endured by the characters. These franchise conventions then provide its audience with a profound sense of superiority. First in the sense of being a safe distance away from the violence, 
even if it's in 3D. And second, potentially possessing a safe social distance away from those otherized on screen. And third, due to the stylistic choices conveying dramatic irony. These take the form of omens, like the number 13, a full moon, thunder, lightning, and heavy rain. And the dramatic irony continues through the resulting folklore of Mrs. Voorhees, Jason's childhood drowning, and the past killings, as with the warnings that the characters receive and disregard. You, the audience, understand the reality of the situation. Some of those on screen never really get the chance. Thus, you sit and watch as the impending cinematic violence is signaled through POV shots, shots where the stalker is partially shown in frame, shots of the killer's shadow, and of course, musical stingers in the form of ch -ch -ch um, itself a reference to the kill, 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 ma, ma of the original film, a sound altered in later entries, such as the evil laugh or cackle version uh, in New Blood, which goes something like, ah, 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 ah. or the ch -ch -ch Jason uh, from Jason Takes Manhattan. Now, over time, the films evolve and reconstitute a fair amount of these structural elements and stylistic choices. For instance, there's a trade-off between the earlier and later films with respect to their endings. The earlier entries featured a final shock or jump scare, a Diabolus Ex Machina, a term from Douglas Cowan, by the way, a surprise that may not even directly involve the film's killer and typically doesn't count as a part of the respected continuity. These events die out once Jason goes full zombie and Jason lives. In their place, we get a traditional Deus Ex Machina, a more benevolent. Uh, Hi. I just wanted so, to yeah. interrupt. Sorry, the slides aren't working. Um, what? So, yeah. Damn. So we can see like the the whole PowerPoint thing. Um, not the individual well, slides, not the presentation mode. That's dumb. Can you see yourselves now? <laughs> yes. All right. So now you can see the slides, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, can you see them now? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Damn it. Well, then, if that's the case, tragedy is struck. But to go fast, um, all these things were timed. So, yes, there's family drama. Yes, there's people dying. Yes, we, we occasionally see it. Um, and to get into uh, all the fun things involving, uh, you know, the source materials of not only the game, but also Camp Counselor Jason, uh, where he's really reimagined in a pretty hypersexualized way, uh, as well as still being this protector deity of Camp Crystal Lake and his connection to the waters and to the ter territory. Um, and yes, there's a lot of fun content involving the mask and repeated elements involving the machete and stock characters of the types of uh, counselors that are, or the you know, human bodies that uh, don't really have that much character development, but at least bare minimum represent uh, easily ways that you categorize them. Uh, usually they're going to be young as opposed to old, like in Jason Goes to Hell, uh, and they're going to be running around the woods as opposed to on a ship in New York or in the suburbs, babes in the woods of those that don't uh, under, uh, fully understand the gravity of their situation, being killed by either Jason, his mother, or someone that he's body hopping with. Um, they're having all sorts of fun being young, being oblivious to uh, the severity of the situation, uh, only to be ambushed and grabbed and thrown and killed, as well as also having a lot of disconnected action of people not involved in the main cast suffering the same fate until few are left to a dramatic chase involving the final girl of hide and seek, of door smashing and breaking everything that is structurally available and also uh, putting in some heavy damage onto Jason himself where you also have the discovery of different bodies or parts of bodies uh, that uh, also lead to dread of the killer. Um, yes, you have the safe analytic distance of being away from the violence, being away from those other eyes, and also having this dramatic uh, irony of knowing the full situation involved with involving these characters where they themselves do not. Omens of lightning and moons and everything else and heavy rain as well as folklore, 
and warnings and POV shots and also dramatic irony where the stalker is included in frame and shadows and everything else involving the sound effects as well. Now, all that to say that Jason himself will also participate in one of these final stingers, reimagined, uh, especially in Freddy versus Jason, uh, where you have this sort of DSX Machina type of ending to save Laurie and Will. Um, he performs in this capacity as a sort of acting last minute savior uh, to these protagonists due to his surprise lake attack on Freddy Krueger. As such, the later films frame Jason as more monstrous than the earlier entries with monster shots, resurrection sequences, other forms of supernaturalism, a reevaluation of Jason's abilities and how much his body can endure. All of which leads to further dramatic irony whenever we see his body left unattended or taken for dead. What then is the meta narrative of this series? The story is being told beneath the surface. A series involving not only final girls and things behind the mask, but final boys and also a trilogy of final kids. A series where at times Jason's monstrosity is meant to convey menace and other times sympathy. Among scholars, there are four primary interpretive strategies, four ways of analyzing the monster that dwells at the gates of difference. Veridika presents the Voorhees family drama as a temporal terror, stories of extreme trauma whereby past events, despite local efforts of collective disremembrance, return in the form of a violent avenger, killing strangers as symbolic substitutes. For certain protagonists, though the killer is subdued, the hero slash heroine's triumph is not liberating. Gone are the illusions of everyday normality. And for now, she has to live for the memory with the memory of her murdered friends. Kara Clover then presents the Friday premise as an articulation of male anxieties regarding female sexuality. Cinema that seeks to reify conservative worldviews within narratives that punish deviants and outsiders in grisly and inventive ways. As David Grieven later adds, the heroine's maturation and triumph achieved at the end of the film ultimately come at the expense of a queer masculinity figured as monstrous. The final girl is a prohibitive disciplinary figure, he writes, battling against a monstrous male whose monstrosity lies not in his sexual threat to the heroine, though there is always a threat of physical violence, but in his lack of a functional sexuality of any kind. More recently, Jason Wallen presents the Jason killer, though the same applies to his mother Pamela, as an unstoppable force of nature, an eco-stalker, uh, thoroughly embedded within the environment. This conflict between humanity and nature accounts for the elemental fury of thunderstorms and full moons coordinated with his assaults. Even prior to the explicit supernaturalism defining the later entries, the series is governed by a dark natural order that dramatizes the tension of two natural drives, that of life and death, with the wilderness superimposed onto both. Finally, Kam Singh Singh uh, and Carter Souls present Jason uh, especially as the backwards berserker of the American wilds. The film simultaneously otherize and empower Jason's hillbilly whiteness as a form of superior rurality, a harbinger of pre-technological death, romanticizing poor white country folk as capable and resourceful despite their marginalization. The title of this paper in part is inspired by Gene Siskel's review of the final chapter, part four. The film is literally about stabbing. In other words, if you like this picture, what you have liked, I believe, is the idea that someone will get a stick put through their body because that's essential. That's the essence of this movie. The message that it sends out is not that the world is, this is the way the world is. Siskel's response to Roger Ebert's critique that the film cynically kills young people with dreams. But the message and it is mostly girls, again, getting stuck, is entertainment. That's the pornography. That is legitimate entertainment. Siskel's comments appear uh, in line not only with Clover's interpretation of the material, but also in a stance that disregards the content, structural, and stylistic elements of the series in favor for the message of the meta narrative. I agree in part that the essence of the franchise expands past its surface level content, it is not enough to say Jason and the Voorhees family lies at the core of the series. The structural elements of the Friday entries are also quite pliable. In the video game, for instance, the because Jason is controlled by a human player, killing counselors based on skill, choice, and chance, the tomboyish girl next door counselor need not survive the match, just as the black jock need not die early. 
Clover's final girl meta narrative is explicitly absent from the game and the two other cases I've presented, a likely effort made by their respective creators to refresh the formulaic conventions of the series and subgenre. Thus, I argue that it's specifically Jason's fluid function within this creative complex of meta narrative that marks the true essence of the character and the franchise. Case in point, in the recent video game, Jason operates as a ego stalker, innately tied to the environment, his environment, regardless of layout, as, uh, as established from his debut from uh, Friday 13th Part 2. Darkness is on his side. So are the trees, the waters, and other obstacles in the woods. The game incentivizes Jason players to stalk and scare their victims in order to win the match. A counselor's fear increases under the following conditions of being near Jason or hearing his scary music, seeing or hearing Jason destroy objects like doors and windows, being alone, moving around the woods or in dark areas without a flashlight, occupying a building without barricading all the doors, not wielding a weapon, and seeing a corpse or someone being killed. What then is the cost of said fear within this game? At stage one, the counselor is at ease. At stage two, they become visually nervous with panic grafted onto their faces. Stage three brings about fear penalties, whereby counselors stumble when moving, shriek, or make other detectable sounds. And finally, at stage four, the counselor is hysterical, appearing bright red on Jason's radar, and intense fear also reduces your stamina recharge rate. Thus, because Jason can overpower and outperform every camp counselor, and since each game is timed at 20 minutes, it is within Jason's best interest to slowly stalk and kill each counselor while inducing as much fear as possible. Jason also gains further abilities the longer the match lasts. Counselors once terrorized into fear stage four will begin to lose their vision and spatial awareness, unable to detect if Jason and others are near or even what part of the map they occupy. Jason's command of the wilderness, however, never diminishes. While counselors can pick up many cabin items for either protection or assault, <clears throat> Jason is capable of environmental kills, using the space around him for creative and innovative brutality, just like the films. He sees all the moves within his terrain, <clears throat> even capable of silencing his musical stingers when stalking. He is able to shift and teleport anywhere onto the map. Though POV is not available in the game, Jason does temporarily gain evil dead vision, if you get my reference, when shifting through space, preserving the sense of dramatic irony for any non-player that watches gameplay. Now, for Never Hike uh, alone, we see an advanced hiker comfortable with navigation and equipment assembly and overcoming rough terrain, itself a romantic form of rural whiteness, come across his most dangerous natural challenge to date, the Backwoods Berserker. Here we see a competition for modern masculinity, where Jason himself represents dominance over nature, and potentially over other male competitors. Finally, Camp Counselor Jason lampoons much of the queer subtext within the Jason mythos, further vilifying the mother while reimagining the son as a sympathetic character, an eco-stalker still, but with a new sense of purpose, an occasional killer of local bullies even if it is accidental. Yes, that is Krug and company from Last House on the Left, by the way. Now, while there is much more to say about this topic, I conclude with a reiteration of my point that the Friday the 13th franchise stems from a creative complex of four major meta-narratives, more complex than Clover's initial understanding involving the persecution of women and putting them in dread and involving a queered uh, monstrosity as the killer and so forth. There's other things going on involving issues of the past, if you read Dika, and they're involving other things involving his connection to nature or involving also the place of his whiteness in the story, of having this type of capability and resourcefulness, even though he is marginalized. Uh, uh, hopefully, the other Matt, over time, uh, please email me if you got questions. I'm wchavis at ucsb.edu. And please enjoy yourselves, and thanks for having me. Okay, thank you very much. You were right on time. You were just at 20. Um, so our next presentation, we're going to move the schedule around a little bit, uh, will be the paper by uh, Lisa Avron and Val Valeria Dani. 
So Lisa Abron uh, recently received her PhD in science and technology studies from Cornell University. Her project, Knowing and Responding Beyond Belief and Denial of Climate Science in Florida, redefines climate predictions as social objects that create openings for epistemic, um, political, and ethical formations, which we can only understand once we look beyond the political spectacle of belief versus denial, uh, structuring current debates. She is foremost interested in the ways anti-racist, anti-poverty climate justice activists bridge historic injustices with predicted climate change futures to rewrite um, apocalyptic narratives of global warming uh, from the margins. Uh, she sees hor the horror genre as ripe for fresh perspectives and analysis as a critical tool for opening up a new conversation about our political economic moment. Uh, Valer Valeria Dani received her PhD in it Italian studies from Cornell University, and she previously studied, studied at La Sapienza in Rome and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Her research, uh, which variously employs hermene hermeneutics and the Jewish mysticism, focuses on contemporary poetry with so strong interest in critical theory, feminism, and film studies. Dani's project titled uh, Anna Deploy Climax, Ascensions and Downfalls in Italian Poetry, studies the rhetorical figure of repetition called Anna Deploys, uh, which Danny analyzes both from a historical and theoretical perspective, uh, wielding it as a tool to intervene in debates about the philosophy, around the philosophy of language, political theology, and the limits of representation. An active translator of Italian theory, she is currently carrying out a Mellon ACLS public fellowship as a second project, she works on philosophy and horror and on cinematic representation of women in the genre. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, so thank you for having us here tonight. Um, as you can tell, I think from my biography, uh, my autobiography that I wrote there, that uh, horror and uh, horror analysis and movie analysis isn't my, my primary study, but it is a deep passion of mine that I, I've shared and connected with uh, with Valeria for years now um, uh, during our studies at Cornell. Um, and so we're, I'm just really excited to be here with you today um, to talk about uh, slaughtering dualism. So with that, I'll pass it to Valeria so she can introduce herself. Yeah, thank you very much for welcoming us here. Similarly to my colleague and very, very, very close friend, Lisa, um, horror does not represent the center of my research. Um, rather, it is a passion that throughout the years has offered the theoretical and political fields I operate within the opportunity to measure themselves against a concrete, rich, and extremely impactful object. So, um, everybody can see the presentation? Yes? I can. Yeah. Um, perfect. So <clears throat> this brief presentation encapsulates a series of initial thoughts we look forward to developing in the future. For today, we wish to address the shift we believe took place in the ontological and moral apparatus of contemporary horror movies. The first generation of slashers from its origins until the late 80s um, or first years of the 90s provided spectators with a rigid and in this sense comforting set of moral values that were crystallized by a clear opposition between good and evil, an opposition that obviously was reinforced by the very tangible manipulative affect that is fear. We are ascribing this opposition to a rather Manichaean um, view of the world where the absolute categories of good and evil are in perpetual dynamic opposition. This opposition, as she, uh, as the constantly quoted and brilliant Clover's seminal Men, Women, and Chainsaws illustrates, does possess a fair amount of ambiguities. Nevertheless, spectators are oriented towards a rather comforting scenario. In contrast, we argue that a consistent number of contemporary slashers and horror movies more generally stand in a space of liminality where the ethical framework that so tightly constrains the horror narrative of the past dissolves into a more enigmatic, less dualistic landscape. In this sense, we must ask, what does this shift imply, especially when taking into consideration the analytic path investigating spectatorship and identification, 
And secondly, if the contours of and separation between good and evil are far from fixed, how do we give meaning to the world and moreover to our positionality within it? Um, so the majority of slasher films uh, are as predictable and ritualistic as communion. Uh, in fact, as the speakers for today have highlighted, repetition and riffing defines the genre. Uh, rather than merely producing fantasies, they actually reproduce societal, ethical, political norms on screen through inversion. Um, good, evil, beauty, beast, woman, man. Um, uh, victim, villain, villain, dualisms. Uh, showing audiences, what I mean by this inversion is that when you show audiences what shouldn't be, uh, you reify this normative agreement of what should be in your everyday life. Um, so that when the credits roll on the slasher fantasy, we spill out into the predictable real world where the tropes we just watched uh, live only quietly in our subconscious. Um, and we know what is right and what is wrong, how we should act and how we shouldn't. Even if, even if what is right and good is occasionally defied by acts of real world terror, terror you can see you know, in true crime, uh, we understand this true crime as exceptional. Uh, we read it against a backdrop of normalcy constituted by well-defined categories and expected normative behaviors. The liberal societal agreement still stands when we leave the movie theater. Um, but movies, movies like this presentation's quintessential example, Us, uh, Jordan Peele's Us, um, are similarly products of their time. Their narratives and form provide a map key with which analysts can build some interpretation of our political, economic, and societal landscape. But it, they show us something different. Um, they show us something unexpected about our moment, not an inversion, Right, so not uh, what shouldn't be and what should be, uh, or what should be or what shouldn't be, um, but an allegory. How things are, not what we want or what we hope to be real for us. And instead of reproducing the stifling prison of tropes and the dualisms of good and evil, our protagonists demonstrate agency, creativity, and nuanced characteristics. Um, moreover, by the end of the film, we are left with the more uneasy horror of our nuanced selves. With the dualisms of good and evil slaughtered, we are left to contend with the lessons about our world the film shows us. We are sure that many of you are, are already familiar with the famous definition of postmodernity offered by Jean-François Lyotard in 1979 and translated in English in 1984 around the impossibility of a meta-narrative. Um, quote, and I'm quoting here, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity towards meta narratives. In other words, Lyotard signals our lack of trust in a grandiose shared meaning. In Frederick Jameson's terms, capitalism and postmodernism unveil the incapacity of our minds, at least at present, to map the great global multinational and decentered communicational network in which we find ourselves caught as individual subjects. The pre-postmodern slasher provides spectators with a formula, a map, a cognitive map, so to you know, um, quote Jameson once again, that can help, uh, can help them navigate the ethical and ontological dynamics of modern capitalist America, mutilated then as now by racism, class inequalities, ableism, and patriarchy. This map wishes to signal the right way, the more desirable route, so to speak, in a legible manner. Postmodern horror seems to focus elsewhere. And this elsewhere, which does indeed escape a definite reading, has the merit of representing allegorically the hicket nunc of the present. We are here employing Walter Benjamin's definition of allegory, um, from the Greek, as we know, uh, to say something else a rhetorical object that is radically opposed to the more immediate symbol, which establish, establishes a more direct relationship with the object it wants to represent. The allegory presents us with the scattered fragments of an unintelligible dying presence, present, <clears throat> opaque shards that it is our responsibility to piece together through our individual gaze. 
And this means that a collective shared meaning is far from possible. We have entered an invigorated phase of interpretative moral fluidity. Dualisms thus disappear in post-capitalism, and we are left with the question, if evil is invisible, or even more tragically, it is within us, what are we left to fight? How can we build resistance? So let's, let's show you what we mean. Um, so pre this kind of turn of uh, pluralistic ethics and the slaughtering of dualisms that we've seen in the horror genre um, that has left this impression on us, uh, we have movies, of course, like Halloween, uh, like our previous panel really dove into. Um, we have the Nightmare on Elm Street classic. And we, ha we even have uh, these kinds of dualism present in this supposedly postmodern, like hyper self-aware uh, film franchises like Scream. Um, I love these images uh, in this slide because it's this direct sort of dualism, the good, the evil, the man, the woman, uh, the victim, the villain, uh, that, that reproduces itself over and over and over again in these classic slasher films. So the shift um, that we are trying to highlight is more than evident in the so-called, and this is only a, an example, the so-called revenge movies subgenre. From the Japanese army of um, dead wet girls, as David Kalat called them, who come back to scare and haunt their perpetrators, to the long tradition of rape revenge movies, spectators are left with a disoriented and anti-dualistic ethical world their empathy were distributed towards the agents of violence. The most recent and certainly, it's certainly more interesting examples of this radical change are Mandy, who entertains us with a deranged and yet relatable rage embodied by a sublime, let me say, Nicolas Cage, and It Follows, a film that traverses the ruins of a destroyed Detroit while attempting to chase an evil that is perpetually dislocated in multiple teenage subjectivities. So an element, uh, an enduring kind of element that we see uh, across this, this new pluralistic ethical landscape, this turn in horror films is um, you can analyze it in terms of the individual or the structural. So it follows as a really great example of the uh, the individuals, the, the individual becoming uh, their own worst enemy. Um, whereas other films such as Us demonstrate a more structural kind of analysis for us to take home with us. Um, both are allegories for our time but one is focused more inwards on the individual, while the other is a structural analysis. So uh, we're gonna dive a little bit more deeply into the case study of us. Um, Valeria, could you get to the next screen? Thanks. So from the relatively temperate opening carnival scene of us, Jordan Peele foreshadows how good and evil will fold in on itself throughout the film. As the waves gently lap the shore outlining the boardwalk lights, a little girl wanders away from her arguing parents into a funhouse. The audience is first introduced to who will become the slashers of this film as the little girl follows the sound of someone mimicking her whistle. Um, when she turns to face a mirror towards the end of this funhouse scene that's playing right now, uh, we later find out that she is facing herself as a clone. It is extremely apt that the Hall of Mirrors is the portal from which the above people of us meet the below, the forgotten people of us. The lead actress, Lupita Nyong'o, says it best in an interview uh, when she talks about this, this kind of smearing of dualism, uh, for us, the slaughtering of dualism. Um, and the pluralistic ethical landscape that it is presenting to its audience. She says, what about the monster that sometimes comes in the shape of the man in the mirror and the darkness that we humans are prone to and quite naturally inhabit? 
sometimes that darkness goes unattended to, unrecognized, ignored. And it is when that happens that we project it out externally. It becomes the destruction that we then have to contend with. If I myself may riff off a cultural commentator and film critic, uh, Leah Greenblatt, in this film, the evil is among us. It is us to the extent that the ultimate arbiter of good and evil has left us alone to figure it out for ourselves, right? There are no higher gods. There's no transcendent. We are faced with ourselves. Um, you are meant to leave this slasher film uneasy without a safe explanation of who was right and who was wrong, who was good and who was evil. After we see the little girl's petrified face, we are allowed to peer into the underground right after this scene. And uh, we are shown cages of white rabbits. Jordan Peele is quite literally saying to you, I'm leading you down the rabbit hole here. Um, where good and evil is going to become much more complicated to figure out. Uh, and we are quickly after this introduced to the shadow world as um, a doppelganger family breaks into the main family's house to slash them, right? To bind them, gag them and slash them. Um, but before this happens, before the, the great turmoil of the whole film breaks out of the fight between the real family and the doppelganger family, really the us here, um, there's a dialogue between the doppelganger Adela and the real world dad where uh, the supposed doppelganger, doppelganger who's wielding these scissors um, is asked, what are you people? And she responds, we're Americans. Peel practically hits the audience over the head. He's saying this is an allegory, right? This is no longer an inversion where you can leave this movie theater safely saying, you know, I, that is bad. And where I'm, where I'm entering, there's a societal pact, a liberal societal pact, you know, a modern societal pact that we all adhere to and agree to. Um, and I am safe from the Jasons, from the Freddy Kruegers of the world. Here in us, you are watching this uneasy reality of America, right? And I don't think that any of us are really surprised by that because he really hits us over the head. I think what's particularly particularly surprising is how exemplary is is it is this film is of this kind of shift um, that we're seeing across the horror genre landscape. <clears throat> so as 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 to echo that, as Tatiana Cozzarelli and Ezra Brain strongly suggest in their article, we're Americans, class and state in Jordan Peele's Us. This movie seems to be an invigorating representation of class war. And yet it is surpri its surprising ending, which we're not going to spoil completely, um, seems to suggest otherwise. Not only this explanation um, doesn't take into account the reciprocal positionalities of Red and Adelaide, but it shows us that once again, as an allegorical movie, us eludes any univocal interpretation. It disorients us, and the real enemy is and remains invisible throughout the entire film. Booker and Daraise say, said it brilliantly in their recent Lost in the Fan House, Allegorical Horror and Cognitive Mapping in Jordan Peele's Us. They say, and I'm quoting, it is not always so easy to tell who is us and who is them, while also reminding us that our worst enemies might not be some mysterious others, but the darker versions of our own selves. <clears throat> the only coordinate we're left with, eerie and opaque and never fully revealed throughout the movie, this is something that the spectator has to look, uh, actively look um, for, is um, a passage from Jeremiah which constantly and defines the entire film with the impending catastrophe we're all subjected. The passage um, says, quote, Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I'm bringing disaster upon them that they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. And this catastrophe, as us suggests, will be brought upon us by ourselves. Um, I don't know if we have enough time, but we have a clip we would like to, um, to show, if that is possible which is the uh, pivotal conversation that happens in the underground world between uh, Adelaide and Red. 
in this particular um, in this particular scene, uh, as I was saying before, there is this conversation between the two doppelgangers in the movie. Um, and in in my opinion, or at least uh, for my own research, what is interesting is the use of space. Um, so I would recommend everybody like to watch the entire movie. But I don't know, Lisa, if you want to add something. I am I if I think I'm still here. I think Valeria disappeared. Um, okay. Sorry. Yes, I'm still you're, here. You're, you're, you're still here. <laughs> uh, Valeria's disappeared. If she logs back on, I'll bring her right in. Okay. Okay. No problem. Um, I think I, the only thing I wanted to stress stress that I, I don't think maybe we completely described um, is the the kind of the structural analysis that us is making. It's there's clearly the underground people who are um, within this allegory, you know, of the lower class um, and the above ground people who are, you know, the middle class folks who the dad goes out and buys a speedboat, you know, uh, a, a poorly working speedboat for their family and their friends with a white richer family, right? The the clear stratification of, of the, uh, it could not be clear this, this stratification of class. And then the doppelgangers are wearing red jumpsuits which seem extreme and are uh, hell bent on destroying class and connecting across the world, which seems like the big red communist threat, right? So playing across the screen is this huge allegory of, um, you know, the fight of good and evil inside ourselves, but more largely a structural analysis of, of race and class in America. You know, we're Americans, like how much more obvious does it get? Um, Valeria, would you like any concluding thoughts on that? And in that scene, that's where that that plan really gets hashed out, right? That that sort of global takeover um, that you're left with at the end to ponder, you know, is that right or is that wrong, right? Is is that and is that the right question? Probably not. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree with you. Um, thank you, Lisa, for that. I think also like I completely agree with all your uh, different theoretical trajectories but again to go back to the lens that we employed so far the the fascinating element of us in my opinion and I think that you might agree with me is the fact that even when employing these lenses we are also very conscious about the fact that not they they cannot really exhaust the, um, the interpretation of the entire movie. It still mm -hmm. remains, even if we employ racial capitalism as an example, um, <clears throat> or um, racism or class struggle, it, you know, yet the movie remains incredibly opaque. There are some mysteries and that really in that sense, I think goes back to Walter Benjamin's um, definition of the allegory as again like a series of fragments that are scattered on the floor and maybe like in, in a way like representing in their lack of um, an univocal a sort of like only meaning they represent the scattered reality that is America today as an example right so exactly in so ineffable this, unable to represent unable to pin down with any any definitive uh, meta narrative, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I would end here, and we hope that we have conveyed the impressions that are informing our theoretical and aesthetic and political at this point experience of Slasher through this brief presentation. And we look forward to your questions, suggestions, and future engagements with our research. Thank you very, very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Um, so uh, feel free to put your questions on the chat. Um, we have one more presenter, um, Eric Brick Brickman. Uh, Aaron Brickman received his PhD in theater, film, and media arts from Ohio State in the summer of 2020. His dissertation theorizes around affect, audience reception, and the cultural limits of failure in theater and film. Drawing from performance studies, affect theory, critical race, feminism, and film studies, his dissertation argues that the multiple and diverse backgrounds and understandings of artists and audiences engender effectively complex responses to gender, sexuality, and race in film and theater that both implicate and offer liberatory potential. Great, thank you. Let me... Uh... Um, I slightly changed the title of my paper right now. I'm calling it Non-Binary Neoliberal Final Girls in Neo-Slasher Films. 
which is a lot of ends, but I'm a, my training is initially in Shakespeare studies, so I love alliteration. So um, breakthrough insights in queer theory and transgender studies have provided blueprints for horror scholars to reconceive long-held academic and cultural assumptions about the genre. One trope overdue for reconceptualization is Carol Clover's Final Girl, originally described in her 1992 Men, Women, and Chainsaws, uh, which sounds like everyone's familiar with. Clover's conceptualization is firmly embedded, as her title implies, in her circa 1990s understanding of a strict male-female binary. As such, it does not and could not do justice to the complexity of the final girl's actual place in horror. This paper argues that the single most important element of the final girl is actually uh, their gender fluidity. For example, Sigourney Weaver's Ripley in Alien easily shifts between feminine and masculine coded behaviors as she both chooses to retreat from the alien xenomorph rather than fight it head on like a typical male action hero of the 70s or 80s would, um, but is also confident in her decision making and able to quickly make life and death decisions without deferring to the men around her. In contrast, okay, yep, uh, see, yeah, Ripley. <clears throat> um, do, 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 do. In contrast to thanks, that's it. In contrast to the more butch heroines of her of later films, such as her more action-oriented treatment in James Cameron's 1986 Aliens, or a one-armed shotgun wielding Linda Hamilton in Terminator 2, that's the next slide. More recent incarnations of the final girl uh, in neo slasher comedies, such as Tree and Happy Death Day, Millie and Freaky, or more recently Dina in Netflix's Fear, Fear Street trilogy, more fully reflect the original gender fluidity of final girls like Ripley. Beyond the male neoliberal fantasies of masculine encoded feminist heroes that appear in the prequels and sequels of the original Final Girl classics, such as uh, Scott's 2012 Prometheus or David Gordon Green's 2018 Halloween, characters like Tree, Millie, and Dina easily move back and forth between romantic and action oriented scenes, recapturing the gender fluidity of their earlier original predecessors. Still at odds with their preceding figures, however, are the ways in which neo slash for Final Girls are also encapsulated within neoliberal logics that have become the dominant worldview in post-1970s America. In the preface to her 2014 Princeton Classics edition, Clover protests that pop culture, the, the pop culture understanding of her conception of the final girl misses the heart of her original argument, reminding us that she originally described the final girl as a victim hero with emphasis on victim. She argues that to see the final girl as a kind of archetype for female heroes is to miss the point. So there's the giant blob of text. I'll just read the last line. Um, so as I call her the victim hero with emphasis on victim, it's a great moment when she stops the killer, but to imagine that her and our experience of the film reduces to that last minute reversal is truly to miss the point. I would argue Clover is responding to the way that film directors and genre critics have used the trope of the final girl as a kind of get out of jail free card, embracing the positive elements of Clover's analysis and completely disregarding Clover's criticism of the trope. They lean into the surface level understanding of the final girl as a gritty, plucky survivor and ignore Clover's accusations of misogyny that center on the previous 90 minutes of her torture. Fans and critics often equate a character's survival in a horror film as a kind of moral argument. Bad characters are killed off, leaving the morally or culturally superior character in the form of the final girl as the only character left alive. Interventions into understandings of the final girl in films post Claire Clover's identification of the trope have therefore focused on rereading aspects of her character according to this convention, the, the, the pop convention. Thus we get Casey and Scream surviving despite having sex, breaking the convention of the virginal final girl as a kind of girl power argument for her right to be sexually active. These kinds of surface level readings of the final girl misunderstand the power of her original cultural intervention, uh, I think. Uh, in the original late, uh, late 70s and early 80s films in which she appears, she is not so much a girl power neoliberal refashioning of female agency, but an expression of nonconformity freed from the cultural constraints of the expectations of what it means to be female. I want to ask what it means to read Ripley and Alien not so much as a woman exerting her individual will in a male-dominated world, but as a person who chooses to act in ways that could easily be described as either male or female, depending on the needs of any particular context. In other words, her gender fluidity allows her to act in ways that ignore female and male boundaries. This non-binary approach to behavior allows her to act in the most beneficial way in any particular context, which results in her survival. Um, instead of being severe, instead of her being forced into a mode of prescribed behavior based on cultural understandings of gender, uh, like the male and female foils for her character in Alien, Dallas, and Lambert. Two simple examples suffice. Unlike Dallas, Ripley flees or hides when confronted by the alien xenomorph. 
where Dallas, playing the role of brave male hero, leaves the ship to investigate the beacon and enters a system of unlit tunnels with a flamethrower to kill the alien. At the conclusion of the film, Ripley hides from the alien first and then figures out a way to blow it out of an airlock, avoiding confronting it directly. Uh, convert, uh, no, go back up one. There are not two that one yet. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Conversely, when Lambert, playing the stereotypical overly emotional female, is confronted with the likelihood of their deaths, she breaks down emotionally several times, and when finally the alien finds her, she freezes, resulting in the alien killing both her and Parker, who, as the male, bravely tries to rescue her. Thus, the film seems to suggest that Ripley survives because she's able to choose between male and female stereotypes of behavior, neither engaging in stupidly male behavior nor falling into emotional excesses that prevent her from make, uh, making taking definitive action. She's able to avoid the extremes of male behavior informed by an obsolete male honor code and both stereotypes of female indecisiveness. She is neither strictly coded male nor female in her behavioral choices, but is able to choose between them and make the best decision for her particular context. This ability of the final girl to choose between male and female behaviors contextually while avoiding the extremes of both slowly disappears from subsequent films. In Aliens, now we're to the gun photo. In Aliens, the, the sequel, Ripley uh, slowly comes to resemble the military figures James Cameron surrounds her with, interp in interpreting the final girl as representing male bravado in a woman's form. She takes control of the tank when the fresh lieutenant freezes, shoving him out of the way to drive the survivors to safety. And in the conclusion of the film, she fights off the queen alien with an exosuit, directly, directly confronting the creature with a typical bravado of the male 1980s action hero. By 1991, Cameron has transformed Terminator 2's final girl, Linda Hamilton, into a shotgun-toting badass who is trained in military combat. She gets into physical confrontations with her wardens and fights off advanced sci-fi shape-shifting robots with a shotgun. No subtlety here. Sarah Connor does not choose between direct confrontation or hiding, decision-making, or feeling emotion. She blasts her problems with a shotgun. Cameron takes what others have called the tomboy aspect of the final girl and cranked it up to 11, butching her up and removing her capacity to make emotionally intelligent decisions. See enemy, shoot enemy, lose child custody, and end up in a mental institution. More recent iterations of the final girl, however, have seen a return to her capacity for emotion and logical decision making depending on context. In Christopher Landon's 2017 Happy Death Day, Tree slowly becomes more emotionally available to her love interest father and friends, while simultaneously making plans to assassinate her physically restrained killer. At the conclusion of the film, she wins a fight to the death against her roommate by defenestrating her a la Shaft. Along the way, she coaches a closeted gay man to be true to himself, corrects the inappropriate behavior of her love interest roommate, leaves her adulterous relationship with a college professor, and admits her emotional shortcomings surrounding her mother's death, and repairs her relationship with her father, all in a day's work for a contemporary final girl. Similarly, in Landon's 2020 Freaky, Millie finds love and works on her codependency issues with her mother and emotionally absent sister while simultaneously learning to navigate the world in a male body. Where Happy Death Day is a horror twist on Groundhog Day, Freaky is a postmodern horror mashup of Friday the 13th and Freaky Friday. Um, originally, it was called uh, Freaky Friday the 13th, but they were afraid they were going to get sued, so they just changed it to Freaky. Uh, Millie switches bodies with a serial killer instead of her mother, their body switched by a magical knife instead of a fortune cookie, um, thereby also substituting stereotypical magical realism for orientalism, but I digress. Uh, Freaky differs from Happy Death, Day, Happy Death Day in a few respects, focusing less on Millie as a kind of natural self-help guru to perform a surface level engagement with visibility politics. Where the main characters in Happy Death Day are almost exclusively white, except for the villain, of course, in Freaky we get a loud, out and proud gay character and a strong black woman as Millie's best friends. Freaky aligns itself more, even more closely than Happy Death Day with its slasher forebears by including a final girl that can not only switch between prescribed male and female behaviors, but who also literally switches between male and female bodies. But although Freaky offers a fairly progressive reading of a female to male non-binary character, it also juxtaposes this with an equally potentially regressive reading of a male to female character, and then finally concludes with a return to normative context. The film includes suggestively transgressive moments, including a wonderful scene in which Millie and the Blissfield Butcher's body, who's played by Vince Vaughn, uh, flirts with her would-be boyfriend Booker in the back of a small car. And then there's another moment where, an out, where the out and proud uh, gay friend Josh tries to trick his mother into believing, believing he is performing sexually oriented role to play with Millie. Uh, he tries to convince his mother that he's straight uh, because he's, um, having, he's enjoying a sex game with a straight girl. Um, 
In almost every case, however, where the film suggests something transgressive by its conclusion, it reverts back to and reinstantiates gender and sexual norms. Millie and Booker wait until Millie is back in her female body to kiss, and Josh refuses a sexual relationship with Millie as a man or a tete-a-tete -tete with a closeted gay football player he earlier claims he's looking for. Similarly, by the simple fact of casting a lead character who is a lesbian, Fear Street, on the surface, appears to go further in its queer non-binary politics than Freaky, and to its credit, its queer characters remain queer, uh, kind of. Dina starts and ends the film a lesbian involved with Sam, but the conclusion of the trilogy also leans hard into Dina's role as a surrogate mother for her brother Josh. And again, closer analysis reveals a surface level engagement with a colorblind adjacent identity politics that, for example, cast straight models as butch lesbians who have no explicit politics. For example, in Ursat's proto-feminist Dina is not interested in challenging or overturning patriarchy explicitly. She merely wants to be able to pursue her individual love interest, achieving this goal by the end of the trilogy. However, the subtext of the series is that power is corrupting, so Dina never makes any attempt at desiring, accessing, or maintaining power, political or otherwise. By explicitly contradicting her culpability in the story as a witch, the plot refuses to make a villain out of its main lesbian character. However, by doing this, it also removes her capacity to challenge systemic injustice. Dina seeks to undo the wrongs done to Sarah Fear by killing, killing Officer Good, her individual quest for revenge placated when he is killed. Again, the subtext being justice is achieved by the death of one individual back, bad actor rather than engaging in a systemic critique. In a news cutaway, uh, Officer Good's wealthy and politically powerful family explicitly denies any knowledge of his wrongdoing and appears to suffer no ill effects from his denunciation and death. At the beginning of Fear Street Part 1, an explicit callback to Scream, Heather attempts to fight off the slasher in a skull mask assaulting her in the mall. She blocks a knife stab, runs away, calls 911, hides, distracts him with a sex doll, and then hits him on the head with a lava lamp, displaying all the gritty resourcefulness we are taught to expect from a final girl, before she is finally then killed and stabbed before he's also shot. Her ability to fight back and get a shot in on her attacker feels like a nod to what Satiris, um, I'm not sure about this name, Petritus, in his anatomy of slasher films uh, calls a refreshingly alert post-feminist sensibility, which both refers back to and updates the proto-feminism of the slasher films, Final Girl from the late 1970s and early 1980s. Um, in an interview with IM on IMDb with actor Ryan Simpkins, who plays Alice in Fear Street, she remarks that we center on people who don't usually make it. Like we have, I think I have this one, if you wanna go to the next one, it might be the, oh, go one more please. Thank you. Uh, we center on people who don't usually make it, like we have a bunch of weird, quirky, awkward outcasts, whether they're queer or poor or dorks in general. And then uh, lead actress Kiana Madeira also adds, among that is also people of color we don't traditionally see survive in horror films. It shows their strength and their resilience, and I think that's just a beautiful commentary. Um, and then I have these ones out of order. Could you go back up one, please? Um, and this is the tagline then to that to that video interview. Uh, the names of the actors uh, discussing Fear Street share how Netflix film trilogy subverts the typical slasher formula and makes heroes out of characters who would have been killed off in prior horror films. The powerful neoliberal media institutions like Netflix and IMDb claim casting marginalized identities and allowing them, allowing them to survive subverts the genre of the slasher film is part and parcel of a strategy to increase their subscription base by embracing aspects of liberal politics that is not only does not subvert, but instead rather homogenizing in its effects. In fact, the opening character of Heather in Fear Street might be read as a metaphor for the ill-fated trope of the final girl herself. Initially interesting, she draws our attention briefly long enough for her to get a shot in and then is and, and, and is then murdered. The Neo Slasher final girl captures our critical attention initially, but then is simply reabsorbed back in the neoliberal feminist logics of individual success and failure. Although the current crop of final girls recaptures some of the important non-binary gender aspects of the original final girls, this superficial engagement with the trope by directors embedded in neoliberal modes of production manifests in a number of ways. Final girls who symbolize neoliberal girl power star logic, such as now, if you can go to, that will catch us up. Thanks. Uh, final girls who symbolize neoliberal girl power logic, such as they're only interested in individual, not explicitly political goals. They all uniformly uphold norms of beauty, heteronormativity, and heterofuturity. And they offer no challenge to the promulgation and continuation of the values of late stage capitalism. 
So then in conclusion, at the beginning of Happy Death Day, the Universal logo stops and restarts several times, imagined as an in-joke, prefacing Tree being forced to experience Scream as Groundhog Day. However unintended, this repetition of the logo also can metaphorically stand in for the ways in which the film restages over and over the subtextual investments of a neoliberal late-stage capitalism. While offering in some ways a novel approach to the slasher film, it also repeatedly reenacts the implicit values of single actors, self-made survivors, or bad apples, mixed with elements of American exceptionalism that mark films made in the post-1970s United States. The final girls of these neo-slasher films, while seeming to recapture some of the lost gender, gender fluidity of their earlier predecessors, also instantiate these symbolic investments as part and parcel of our neoliberal long durée, each appearance reinstating subtextual investments and predatory capitalism as, as exceptional figures that stand alone, gritty and fierce in their resistance to individual bad actors. All right, and then I think I have a thank you slide with my email address on it. So any uh, critiques, uh, comments, I'd be happy to receive. Thank you. Okay. So we have a few questions. Um, let me see. So one of the first questions uh, was for all panelists. Thank you so much for amazing papers. And um, I have a lot of my own questions, but uh, let's start with the ones people posted first. Uh, so what do you all think um, is the relationship between slasher film and this idea of class warfare or class war? Um, and how do you see that play out in the text that you look at? So relationship between slasher and class warfare. I can start. Um, I will. I will say I, I saw that question, and the the to me the the granddaddy was um, ready or not, which um, I just had a blast watching, um, even with the you know Satanist twist on it. Um, but um, in, in terms of like class warfare, of that being you know having a very elitist you know kind of ceremonial initiation. Uh, into the family that uh, the new bride has to go through. But uh, in my stuff specifically with the Friday 13th series, it's not usually one that people may think of as having like classist tropes involved in it. Um, and yet it's a part of this, you know, kind of like a hills have eyes and, you know, what, what exactly happens in the backwoods of America. Um, and so I, I really liked, you know, uh, reading a, a new kind of interpretive strategy of trying to see this like romanticizing of like poor white resentful country folk that despite uh, issues of marginalization are actually quite capable. Um, and uh, in the essay that I cite from, from uh, uh, Kuni Singh and, and uh, Souls, they actually address in part eight, the fight between Jason Voorhees and Julius, uh, who's this like, you know, big tough black boxer um, from, you know, closer to, uh, to the city. Um, and so what does it mean that big, you know, brooding white body Jason can defeat black boxer with a single punch? Uh, they, they do a lot of fun analysis with that scene, uh, that I recommend people read. Um, but yeah, the, there's a lot of fun things going on in, in that series. Is that better or worse? I don't know. <laughs> I... Yes, um, I think what I want to offer here is that among the many theoretical lenses that we um, as, you know, horror passionate like spectators, we apply to horror movies, class seems to me the one that doesn't recur as much as I would like it to be. Um, and I do think that um, this question is particularly important because it, it really pushes us to think about how to include class, um, especially when talking about, let's say, race, right? Like instead of talking only about race as a sort of abstract kind of category, I think it would be absolutely important, race or gender, to think about racial capitalism, uh, especially in the depiction of the other, right? Like who is the other in, in uh, horror movies? And of course, maybe uh, alongside with this particular um, aspect or trajectory, I would say that uh, maybe the question that we should ask ourselves um, when reading horror movies is, 
um, are horror movies, in fact, an incredibly bourgeois or is horror a bourgeois genre, right? Like in the depiction of suburbia, as an example, and white suburbia more particularly, um, the, the understanding of space, um, what is space, what is outside of space. So um, these are all questions that I am personally, and I know that Lisa is also thinking about these questions alongside with me. But I don't know, Lisa, like I think that we, we talked about, as an example, um, paranormal activity and all that particular, which is, of course, not a slasher movie, but I don't know if you want to add something drawing from our conversations. Yeah, um, I uh, I remember when I was living in New York City, I I went to go see um, a horror film, you know, a classic haunted house sort of horror film, and I returned to my tiny, inexpensive apartment in Brooklyn and thought to myself, can uh, can a can a, could a ghost possibly live in this apartment? How uncomfortable for that ghost, right? Um, the ghost's name was Bagul. I remember I was like, Bagul would not be comfortable in this apartment with our cats, right? Um, the the haunted house, you know, is predicated on a house, a middle-class suburban house or a mansion, right? That somehow a middle-class family has landed, you know, this beautiful mansion, the Amneville Horror House on Long Island. Um, there's so much to do with class and horror. Um, and I think us is has been the most which is why I think I'm so drawn to it and why Valeria is also so drawn to it. It's been this kind of quintessential, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily present an analysis, right? It, it presents you what is. It's like, this is what is right now, you know, for better or for worse. Who are you rooting for, right? It's a, it's a, it's a provocation to a conversation um, that I think is, is, is really necessary and interesting. And I guess that, that's what I'll say about that, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm just, what I realized as I was working on this paper, like I said, it sort of shifted and I felt like I needed to change the title by the time I ended it, was that um, uh, without hopefully valorizing them too much, um, there was a certain quality that 70s films have because they were created post the sort of like establishment of the Hollywood, the reestablishment of the Hollywood system uh, and, and the establishment in the 80s of, of the, and then into the 90s of the sort of like like I said, of the sort of dominant of, of ne the sort of neoliberal view of the world as becoming sort of like the the pervasive view um, of production. So when I look at these like later films, I'm I, I, like I almost I don't see a way how they could get outside of that almost. I mean, because the again, it's just like every aspect of production is controlled in a certain way and produced in a certain way. Um, whatever sort of critique anyone's going to try to um, establish is still going to exist within that neoliberal ethic. I I'm, I'm not even sure how a film would break out of that at this point. Yeah. And I, I think that that's why it's so interesting to think about some of the, like the direct to video and I think, or William, what he was talking about with the comic, right? These different modes of production that allow momentarily for that fluidity. Cause I think Eric, you're right. There is this constant break of, oh. Um, <laughs> there's this constant um, break from the tropes, right? To, to kind of question, point something out, to, to, to be political, right? And then the, the, the system kind of brings that back in and uses it for, for its own um, value with multiculturalism and all that sort of stuff. Um, one of the things that I've wanted to ask you all about is this concept of the enduring woman that Robin Means Coleman presents. Um, so in horror noir, she talks about how the final girl is is traditionally white uh, because at the end of the day, she kills the monster and can go back to, to normalcy, right? The, this idea of good versus evil, the duality that Valeria and, and Lisa were talking about with the enduring woman in um, 70s black exploitation, like Pam Greer, right? She doesn't have that opportunity to, to break and go back to happiness, right? There's no normalcy in that sense. Um, so do you think that that's something we should think about? Like, what does that intersectionality look like, right? Of class, race, gender, and, and the slashers that you're looking at? I 
I, I just want to offer something that maybe, um, Orkida, I don't know if it's really answering your question, but maybe it's a good addition to, to the conversation that we're having that I think is very, very important. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, potential new trajectories of scholarship in, in horror studies, slasher studies, and et cetera. And one of the things that, that I was thinking about, and probably the audience might be able to suggest that something is the analysis of um, domestic, uh, of the role of domestic workers in slasher and horror movies. And I'm thinking about that, especially in its intersection with, um, with gender, right? Which, you know, of course, like a domestic worker is traditionally, very traditionally um, depicted as, as a woman and, you know, a woman of color sometimes, um, oftentimes I would say in American horror movies. So um, that is also that I'm thinking about, and again, uh, apologies for giving an example that is not a slasher per se, but I'm thinking, as an example, the role of the domestic worker in Paranormal Activity Number Two, where you know, like she is the only person that is sensing that something is wrong, but at the same time, this middle upper middle class family in the suburbia, like they just throw her away, they fire her because she is trying to warn the family about the danger that is happening. Or in movies such as the others, and so my question for all of you and for all for for everybody actually in the audience is you know like can you think about the depiction of domestic workers caregivers um that are depicted as others um not only from a working class perspective but also from um you know like um a racial identity perspective in a way the one that comes to mind in terms of like domestic workers is the skeleton key although she's white <laughs> but it's still in, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's in New Orleans, but it's in, it's in Louisiana for sure. But that one is, is a fun example of, you know, inserting whiteness into a, you know, black environment or black situation, which is also, I was, I was thinking about this of, I, I can't wait for the new Candyman um, because Candyman is, is written, you know, from this white perspective of, of taking the Gothic horror and putting it in the projects and putting it in Caprini Green because um, it's originally based, I think, in like a UK story uh, that's like refashioned and retold and put into Chicago. Um, and so, and then you add this like folklore, you know, white grad student that's, you know, the outsider that uh, to uh, your, your point earlier about um, not being, a, the enduring woman can't really leave the conflict, right? Uh, in this one, you have this like outsider woman that's that's white, that's, co that's coming in and collecting black folklore. Um, and similar things are going on in, in the skeleton key, although it also has uh, a white, uh, large white supporting cast, although black bodies are also involved in the terror. Um, but yeah, and, and I, I can't uh, wait for this new Candyman enough because it's actually in, it's, you know, from a black perspective involving black characters of refashioning that story. Um, I, I, uh, I can't, I'm counting down whatever those days are because uh, I think it's going to be really good. Yeah, William, I, I want to jump in and reiterate that because I actually had, um, this will be my final comment because I have to run and catch a plane, but I actually had two slides in our PowerPoint that was an analysis of the trailer because I'm so excited to see the new Candyman um, and how uh, the, the creators are using, are mimicking Kara Walker's the famous black woman artist, Kara Walker silhouette puppetry uh, in order to tell the story of Candyman. And um, I think, uh, again, it, to me, it spoke to the idea of the shift, the, the shift from inversion to allegory and um, this, this invigorating new shift towards uh, uh be, you know, beyond the the token black character and beyond the token, you know, maid or domestic worker. Um, I I think it's there's going to be some critical commentary uh, in this upcoming film on police violence and some critical commentary on uh, gentrification, which I think is going to be really interesting. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up. And I'm going to leave. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this was really wonderful. And I'm so appreciative to have done this. Thank you so much to the organizers, too. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll have to call it a day there. Um, thank you, everyone, for, uh, again, such a fantastic panel for all of your participation. It's been uh, wonderful. So thank you for coming and, and doing so much for us.